On October 3, 1942, a technological singularity occurred on a remote island in the Baltic Sea. A slender, matte green missile, designated the A-4, lifted off its pad, screaming toward the heavens. It climbed higher than any plane could fly, faster than any bullet could travel, reaching the very edge of space before plunging back toward Earth. This moment, witnessed by a handful of stunned German engineers, marked the birth of the V-2 rocket, a weapon so advanced that the men who built it had to invent entirely new fields of science just to solve its problems. But rewind five years to the initial design rooms at Pinamundi, and you find not triumph, but crippling doubt. The head of the program, Werner von Braun, barely in his early twenties, and his superior General Walter Dornberger, faced an engineering challenge that was universally declared impossible by every major power on Earth. They were tasked with designing an engine that could generate 25 metric tons of thrust, a crushing singularity of power, using highly volatile liquid oxygen and alcohol. The established engineers of the German industrial complex scoffed at the requirements. The problem wasn't just the power, it was the control. How do you feed highly corrosive fuel into a combustion chamber, ignite it to temperatures exceeding 2, 700 degrees Celsius, and prevent the entire assembly from simply vaporizing within seconds? When Dornberger pressed the older, more conservative engineers for solutions, their feedback was unanimous and defeatist. They reportedly said, We are building machines of war, not fantasies for the moon, the pressure required is structurally unsound. The cooling problem is insoluble. The only way forward was to abandon established physics and pioneer a path they knew nothing about. The pressure on von Braun was immense, not just from the demands of the Wehrmacht for a weapon, but from the physics itself. They were standing on the frontier of a burning future, yet their blueprints were drawn on the assumption of failure. How did they overcome the first most dangerous hurdle, the impossible fluids, and stabilize an engine designed to explode? Before we dive into the chemical inferno they wrestled into submission, if you are fascinated by the hidden histories and untold insights of the Second World War, subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell, and comment your thoughts on the V2's moral legacy below. The core conflict facing the V-2 team was not the guidance system that would come later. It was the combustion chamber, essentially a crucible of hell that had to remain intact long enough to push the one-ton warhead into the stratosphere. Every early prototype launch ended in a fiery, spectacular failure. The chamber walls, regardless of the alloy used, would simply melt or rupture under the sustained, unimaginable heat. The engine was designed to run for exactly 65 seconds, but it rarely survived 10. The engineers were forced to confront a brutal paradox. They needed more thrust to achieve the required range, but more thrust meant higher temperatures, which guaranteed the rapid destruction of the engine. Von Braun's team, desperate for a solution, began experimenting with unconventional ideas, trying to find a way to cool the interior while the engine was firing. They were forced to invent a concept we now call regenerative cooling. They devised a system where the alcohol fuel, instead of being pumped directly into the chamber, was first circulated through a network of tiny tubes lining the combustion wall and the nozzle throat. This process achieved two critical tasks simultaneously. It preheated the alcohol, making it burn more efficiently, and it acted as a liquid insulator, drawing the destructive heat away from the metal. When the initial designs for this system were reviewed by outside experts, the reaction was pure skepticism. One visiting aerodynamics expert reportedly stated that the design was a pipe dream wrapped in an explosive casing. Doubting that the pumps could withstand the sheer strain required to move the fuel so quickly through the complex cooling jacket, but the engineers had run out of conventional options. They knew that if this radically complex plumbing system failed, the entire program would be scrapped. They were effectively betting the German rocket program on a network of pressurized copper tubing. 
Yet, even after solving the immediate melting problem, they faced another crippling setback. The pumps themselves kept failing under the incredible strain, threatening the entire project once again. The technical breakthroughs required constant staggering financial and political backing, and this is where the engineers faced their most demoralizing internal conflict. By 1942, military impatience was reaching a boiling point. The field commanders wanted a working weapon, not theoretical papers on regenerative heat exchange. General Dornberger was constantly fighting against Hitler's political demands, which prioritized immediate, conventional weaponry over long-term high-risk projects. The stress manifested in extreme secrecy, and a punishing work schedule at Pinamunde, turning the facility into a high-security pressure cooker. Von Braun's personal accounts detail the relentless pressure to cut corners. When they hit a critical plateau where the V2's turbopumps kept failing, unable to deliver the 1,000 gallons of propellant per second required, the military leadership demanded a simplified, less powerful design that could be put into mass production immediately. Von Braun, realizing this compromise would doom the rocket to short-range uselessness, fought back vehemently. He reportedly told Dornberger in a moment of utter desperation that, we are not building a simple bomb, we are building the future, and the future cannot be rushed by political whim. His argument was simple, simplify the design now, and the rocket would never achieve the velocity required to escape atmospheric interference, rendering it inaccurate and strategically worthless. The true political clash came when the engineers successfully perfected the pumps, only to discover a new, bizarre phenomenon. The thrust was wildly unstable due to acoustic vibrations within the combustion chamber. This problem, which they eventually dubbed screaming, threatened to tear the rocket apart mid-flight. After a particularly spectacular test where an A-4 exploded just 50 feet off the ground, a deeply frustrated military official flew into Pinamunde and reportedly declared, the Führer is finished funding these scientific toys. Deliver a reliable terror weapon or deliver your resignations. The screaming problem, the acoustic instability, was the final insurmountable hurdle that separated a magnificent physics experiment from a functioning weapon system. The engineers realized the solution lay not in metal or fuel, but in fluid dynamics and sound waves. After months of frantic, near-impossible troubleshooting, they devised a radical solution. They installed a series of small, precisely placed holes, known as baffles, on the inner face of the chamber. These baffles worked like shock absorbers for the combustion process, breaking up the destructive pressure waves before they could build up resonance and tear the engine apart. The moment they achieved stable combustion was a quiet, profound victory over the physics they had invented. This breakthrough led directly to the critical test on October 3, 1942. When the A-4 rocket lifted successfully and accelerated through the atmosphere, the control bunker at Pinamund was silent. The engineers, who had lived under the shadow of failure for years, watched the telemetry indicators, altitude, velocity, trajectory, climb to numbers previously confined only to theoretical textbooks. When the onboard instruments finally confirmed that the rocket had reached an altitude of 52, 5 miles, crossing the internationally recognized border of space, Dornberger turned to his team, his voice thick with emotion and awe. What did he say? He declared, We have invaded space with our rocket. This day, October 3, 1942, is the start of a new era of transportation, that of travel between worlds. Note the crucial framing. They saw themselves not as armament manufacturers, but as pioneers of celestial mechanics. Yet, this incredible scientific achievement, which should have been a moment of pure intellectual triumph, was instantly overshadowed by a devastating reality. The military had their weapon. The triumph of October 1942 quickly curdled into a moral catastrophe. The V-2, designated as a vengeance weapon, V-2, began raining down on Allied cities in 1944. The engineers, creation, designed to reach the stars, was now a tool for indiscriminate terror, claiming thousands of civilian lives. When the first reports filtered back to Pinamunde detailing the carnage in London and Antwerp, 
The internal discussions among the design team shifted from exhilarating technicality to profound philosophical distress. Von Braun later recounted the chilling detachment many of his colleagues maintained. When confronted with the human cost, the engineers compartmentalized the outcome, viewing the deadly impact as merely a quote quote trajectory correction or a quote 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 range efficiency study. They rationalized their work by insisting they were scientists first, constrained by the military machine second. A famous exchange, often cited in post-war interviews, occurred between two high-level technical directors after reading a casualty report. One director reportedly sighed, What is the difference between this and building a magnificent bridge that collapses? It is a failure of execution, not a failure of physics. They viewed the destruction of London as a manufacturing error, not a moral one. This profound technical genius divorced from ethical consequence is the V2's darkest legacy. Despite this, the ultimate irony of the program is that this instrument of terror was the direct foundational blueprint for the American Saturn V rocket that took men to the moon. The engineers, true statements about the Eastern Front were not about the technical challenges, but about the philosophical weight of their achievement. Von Braun famously stated after the war that the V-2 worked perfectly. It only landed on the wrong planet. It proves that genius, when unshackled by conscience, can deliver the future in the most terrifying package imaginable. What do you think of the engineers? Justification. Were they simply scientists or active participants in terror? Leave your comment below. If you want more high-stakes historical insights and stories that uncover the hidden truths of the past, subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell so you never miss a revelation and share this video with someone who needs to understand the complicated legacy of the space race. These stories need to be remembered.